Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Chinese Swords and Swordsmanship. I'm Scott Rodell here at the Great River Dallas Center, which is home to our Academy of Chinese Swordsmanship. Today I've got this, what I think is a really wonderful provincial Chinese, Qing Chinese gen for you to have a good look at today. Uh, it's a really nice piece, a really stout, solid sword. Uh, and you're probably noticing right away that it seems to have two scabbards. Uh, that's not actually the case, well, sort of that's the case. The owner of this sword had it professionally polished, so it's in really beautiful, fine condition, probably looks a bit shiny on camera. And when you do that, it's always wise to have a resting scabbard made for your sword, because you know, any sort of old dirt or maybe a little bit of rust or something from pre-polish that might be in the original scabbard will scratch your blade. So it's not uncommon when you do have a sword properly restored by a professional polisher to have a storage scabbard made for it. In this case, it's also nice because it helps to preserve the original scabbard as you're not sliding it in and out of there so much. This blade itself is really a, a very solid, robust gen. It's, it's probably one of the heavier gen that I've handled recently. Overall, the gen itself, the whole sword, is 86 centimeters. So that's 33 and three quarters inches long. Uh, it doesn't have a particularly long blade. It's 69 centimeters long, the blade itself. Uh, that's just shy of 27 inches, and it's really, really quite wide here at the base. It's uh, 3.7 centimeters wide. That's a little bit on the wide side, not you know, really exceptionally so, but it's a bit wider than usual. That's about one and a half inches, just shy of an inch and a half wide, but it's a really heavy, solid blade, which is why it's not particularly long. Many people often have a misconception about how long Jin were. At 27 inches, this is maybe just a little bit on the lower end of the historical norm, but at 896 grams, that's just a half ounce shy of two pounds, this sword is, this is really a, a very solid, heavy gen. This is a sword meant to deliver really powerful blows. So when a sword gets that kind of weight at two pounds, of course, you know, when it's short, I can still maneuver it very quickly, but if it were this kind of weight, even if it was really properly balanced and two inches longer or even three inches longer, this would become a very difficult sword to wield with control. I obviously want to keep good control in any kind of combat situation. You don't want to lose control of your weapon. So if you have a particularly heavy gen, one that's around two pounds, sometimes it's even a little bit more than two pounds, you want it to be a little bit on the shorter side, as this one is at, at 27 inches, or just, just, just shy of 27 inches. And by the way, if you're interested in the historical norms for Chinese gen, their lengths, their weights, some stylistic differences, please have a look at the video that I did on Jen and historical reality, and you see the link right there below. Overall, this way this sword is built, this heavy forged blade, makes me think that this sword is probably a little bit earlier blade. Now, there's no way to say for certain that the age of the sword is without disassembling the hilt and having a look at the tang and seeing the patina, the color of the patina in the tank, but you know, you can sometimes make an educated guess. When I handle this sword, and you really feel what a solid cutter it is, that makes one think this is, was forged during an age when you would need a heavy solid cutter. And so that's going to that's gonna be earlier in the Qing period. You know, the, the Manchu or Bannermen or perhaps a Qing literati who, you know, a Han Chinese who was you know, serving with the, with the Qing dynasty. This would have been a sword that would have been used, you know, to face somebody who is in armor, right? There's no need for a sword to be quite this heavy at two pounds. It's certainly, yes, of course, that helps you deliver a much more powerful cut, but you don't always need such a powerful cut. And that kind of weight means it's going to be a little bit slower and your, your strength during any bout is going to flag that much more quickly. So unnecessarily heavy unless you're facing somebody in armor. And so that tends to make one think that this is probably earlier. So I'm thinking early Qing, you know, maybe Qianlong period, uh, but 
could possibly be later. All, again, the only way to really say for certain would be to examine the tang. We haven't done that. When it was fully polished, it was in good shape, so it wasn't taken apart. Now, when I say this is a provincial jet, what do I mean by that? And I think you can see what I mean by looking at the fittings and the overall mountings. It's a very fine blade. If I just tap the pommel here, it just rings like a tuning fork. It just vibrates beautifully in the head. It's a very well forged blade, beautifully heat treated. But when we look at the scabbard and its fittings, we can see that it's, it's not what we might think of as imperial or you know, something like a court sword. During the Qing period, Jin were not the standard weapon that were carried by officials. Dao were. But those people who were uh, you know, really interested in martial arts, more serious about their training, or just you know, perhaps in general, just more drawn to Jian Fa than Dao Fa, might have had their own swords, custom-made swords. This was certainly a, a custom-made piece. This wasn't a, it's not an off-the-rack kind of Jin. And when we look at this, though, it's just very straightforward kind of things. I really love these stylized kind of dragons here on the, on the scabbard. And of course, this sort of a bit of little glass kind of uh, gemstone. So it's a piece made for somebody who certainly had the funds to have a well-made weapon forged for them. It's not a village kind of piece. When I say it's a provincial sword, I'm not trying to in any way say that it's not of a high quality. It most certainly is. It's just not the sort of decoration and the kind of work that we see stylistically de in a decorative sense that lends one to think this was somebody who was attached to the court, who would have been in the capital or in a, in a higher level position. So some, a sword that was probably made in the provinces, and thus being a, a provincial gem. Another interesting feature of this gent is the seven stars. And you can see it has this constellation laid out. Not in the shape of the constellation, but those seven stars. And many people often ask, what's the meaning of that? And nobody, no, we're not quite sure, but I have two, two theories. One is that in Taoism, the star god that determines the time of your death resides at the pole star. And so this constellation that, the Dipper constellation that points to the pole star sort of, you know, is a kind of, uh, perhaps sort of a talisman to that deity to say, not today. <laughs> you know, when you're in the bout, you're fighting for your life, and you're coming around, maybe you want a little extra celestial help. So it could be that. Another really strong possibility is that the seven star constellation is also a symbol of, of Xuanwu, who are also called Xuanda, who is the major deity at Wudang Mountain. And he became a sort of patron deity of the ruling family in the Ming Dynasty, one reason why Wudang kind of ascended, why you have so many buildings there, great temples there, because of imperial patronage. And Xuanwu, of course, carried a jian. He's often depicted with a jian. And as I said, you know, his symbol is the seven stars. So it's quite possible that that is an incantation to Xuanwu as well. We're not 100% sure. And it could be that even the Chinese themselves just sort of forgot after a while and it's just a popular motif that you see on jian. Once it gets popularized, everybody's going to be having that on their sword. Anytime I, I, I get a sword in my hand and I'm able to use it and you know, work with it a little bit, I always kind of think back, who might have this sword belonged to? Who wielded it? And of course, there's no way to know. There's no written records that come with it. But you can kind of get an idea sometimes from the piece itself. And so one thing I was saying earlier, clearly somebody of status and wealth. This is a really just beautifully heat treated sword, really moves with power. This is not a cheaply made sword. It's a good, solid sword. So already that's saying somebody who had the money to go and commission a custom sword for themselves, right? So that's saying somebody of upper rank. Uh, but then again, during the Qing period, the Manchus, they didn't tend to carry jin. Very few people carry jin as a sidearm. Now this, is, this is not a decorative sword. This is a sword really meant for combat. In fact, there's even a couple little nicks in it. You can see where it, it's seen combat. So I'm thinking, who is this? So it's clearly somebody of upper rank, perhaps a bannerman, certainly somebody who is a landed gentry at the very least, and somebody who also was very interested in 
martial arts, which would be kind of rare to have a, a landed gentry member of the Chinese literati, probably somebody who sat for the official exams, who was also really interested in martial pursuits as well as the civil pursuits. So I'm thinking, perhaps somebody like that, oh, another possibility is somebody like a magistrate who, again, was really interested in martial arts, not just the law, but in martial pursuits. But this, again, would have been a fairly rare kind of person in Qing society, certainly amongst the Han people, certainly amongst the literati, certainly amongst the civil administration, such a person would have been quite rare. So that's how I think carry this sword. If you have a different idea as to who might have wielded this really beautiful provincial gen, please let me know what you think. Put your comments below. And as always, we appreciate every subscription. We appreciate those thumbs up. It really helps us to get the word out and support the art. And if you're interested in Chinese swordsmanship, as always, I hope you'll check out the link for the Academy of Chinese Swordsmanship, which is, of course, below in the description. Thanks, everybody. Stay strong and zaijian.